A few weeks back, I was in Hangzhou. I was um, traveling in the car with our Hangzhou campus headmaster, uh, Miss Kath Richardson. As we were moving slowly through the peak hour traffic uh, in the Hangzhou Central Business District among the skyscrapers, um, I was filling the time by chatting with her. I usually, I usually like asking people, especially expats new to China, uh, how she finds it living in China. How does her husband find it? She says very excitedly, um, wow, we love it, uh, especially my husband. He keeps telling friends and family back at home that living in China is like living in the future. That to me is actually, um, of course, a very uh, delightful comment, so I ask her why. She said, oh, it's all the modern technology, all the um, uh, clean um, and modern infrastructure, all the good services. Uh, she talks about it's actually quite amazing for them that in China there is uh, the mobile, uh, mobile payment, our mobile phone is so common that uh, you literally can pay with your mobile phone through a QR code anywhere you go. I really cannot remember the last time I needed cash for anything. Although uh, in China, at Chinese New Year, we do have a tradition uh, of um, stuffing cash in a red envelope and give it to children or grandchildren. And that was, the prob uh, that was probably the last time I had to use cash. But even with that, for many young people nowadays, they start to give virtual red envelopes on their, on their phone app. There is an app for literally everything. Uh, there's bikes on demand. Um, you can order food delivery. You can even, uh, when you go to a restaurant, quite often nowadays, you have a QR code on your restaurant. And you don't need to call a waiter. You just scan the QR code, the menu comes up, and you order your food. And then at the end of the dinner, you actually pay for it on your phone. Uh, so there is, a, there is a modern app for everything. Uh, on the top left of this slide, you can see um, a vending machine. Uh, it's not just any normal vending machine. It's actually one that uses facial recognition to pay for things. So on that one, it goes one step further. I don't even need my phone. It recognizes my face. So you, you just need to set it up once in a payment app, and then, um, uh, and then it recognizes you the next time, the next time you uh, need to buy things from the vending machine. That, that's actually quite convenient. When I go along uh, the river for a jog, uh, I can actually get a drink from the machine without having to even bring my phone. The bullet train is really quite something else. Um, this is world leading for most people who come to China. Uh, this probably would be uh, one of their first experiences uh, for, for fast um, bullet train. I still remember when the first line was built, that was in 2008, and the first line was Beij uh, between Beijing, wh which was where I lived, and Tianjin, which was where um, I was setting up our first school. Uh, so the first line was only over 100 kilometers long, and uh, it travels at over 350 kilometers. And um, so it means I can get from Beijing to Tianjin in less than half an hour, which means door to door, uh, it actually takes about uh, two hours, uh, making the daily commute that I had to make in those days possible. From 2008, uh, and only just over 100 kilometers uh, mileage, to now, we actually have 40,000 kilometers of bullet train uh, in, in China. And that is two thirds of the world's total. And the Chinese government is still planning to double that uh, in the next 15 years. Of course, my, uh, um, my colleagues usually say nice things about China to me because of course they know I'm Chinese and I'm, uh, they, they don't want to hurt my feelings. Uh, therefore, a more objective source of information might be my family. Uh, I met my husband, Martin, when I was studying at uh, University of Oxford, so he was um, a college friend. Um, we got married and we, we now have two children. They were both born uh, and grew up in China, uh, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, we regularly travel back to the UK uh, every year. Um, so they would, compare, they would compare UK and China and point out the negatives that they notice about China. For example, uh, my husband's family is from um, the Newbury area in the UK. Um, for those of you who know that area, it is a really a beautiful, clean and quiet and peaceful England countryside at its best. Whenever I go, the first time I go for a jog along the canal, I see the swans, I see all the natural, uh, the trees and the grass. That is such a contrast to the noise and the pollution 
that uh, we have in Shanghai every day. Um, what they notice in the Chinese people sometimes is the little things, it's the manner and the etiquette. Uh, for example, queuing quite often is a little bit chaotic in China. People, people do, push in, uh, in, uh, do push in in front of you sometimes. And sometimes when they queue, they, get, they come up very close to you. Uh, even I sometimes feel uncomfortable queuing at the airport. There are people who literally will always be so close behind me that they're touching me. So when I try to edge forward a little bit, they actually you know, follow me and touch me again. So I find that, uh, even now, I find that uncomfortable. Um, and also, when people go through doors in, in England, people will always, almost always look behind to see if there is somebody following. If there is, then they're going to hold the door open for you. In China, quite often, you see the door slam shut uh, in front of you, and that's uncomfortable. And maybe the most annoying of all, they still see people spitting uh, on streets. That's happening less and less uh, in, in large cities now, but it is still a habit that some Chinese people uh, have. Um, and the, and the two biggest things that they find bemusing about China uh, are shopping and eating, both of which they hate, actually. Um, this, is, this is, oh, let me just flip the chart, yeah. So these are pictures of uh, a Chinese, a Shanghai shopping center during the Chinese New Year holidays. Um, it is Chinese New Year, it is holidays. It is still during the pandemic, so you can see people are still wearing masks. However, that, that doesn't stop them queuing for hours just in order to get into these luxury shops. Uh, literally, I was going to the cinema at the top floor of this shopping center. Uh, when I got into the shopping center, there was a queue like this. When I came out of the, uh, the, the cinema, um, the queue was still there. So people are queuing for probably more than an hour in order to get into Gucci or Chanel. Uh, that's something that uh, my husband and children really cannot understand. And for those people who have been to any Chinese banquet, um, y usually if it's the first time you experience it, you would be amazed um, and shocked, really, by the amount of food that gets served and sadly wasted. Uh, because in the Chinese culture, um, I guess because we have been through famine, uh, to be generous to friends, meaning that you provide abundant abundance amount of food. Uh, so when you go to a banquet, uh, it is uh, the host's host show of generosity to provide you with far more food than you can actually finish. Um, sometimes Western people come to a Chinese banquet and usually we start with cold dishes. There are usually maybe eight, eight cold dishes on the table uh, before you even sit down. Uh, and sometimes uh, people think that's all that, you know, for Western people who are not used to this, uh, people think that's all the food there is going to be. So they actually fill themselves with these old dishes. Little do they know that one by one, all these hot dishes will come out, then soup will come out, then in the end, uh, noodle. So the whole table will be piled up with maybe another 10 additional dishes of hot dish, and maybe half of it gets wasted. And also what's um, a, a cultural shock to many people are the constant toasting, mutual toasting of the baijiu, which is a Chinese liquor uh, with quite often with alcohol percentage of more than 50%. Uh, people don't, don't sit down and just drink their own drink. Every time they want to drink themselves, they toast to each other. So the whole table end up drinking at the same time. So these are maybe uh, differences that my colleagues wouldn't necessarily comment to me, but nevertheless, my, pe uh, my family being very uh, open and, uh, and uh, open with me, they would comment on these things that they experience in China that they don't necessarily like or agree with. Wellington, China is a community of more than a thousand employees now. Um, and they come, from, they come from 30 different countries, so they, they represent 30 different nationalities. Um, vast majority of them are from China, so we have 62% of our staff from China. That is because most of the non-academic staff uh, are actually local Chinese employee, uh, and uh, uh, plus the, some of the academic staff and TA and etc. But the second major nationality is British, is, uh, is UK. And that's also understandable because after all, we are Wellington College. We are Wellington College uh, opening, uh, operating in China. Therefore, our British staff and our Chinese staff, plus 
other staff from you know 20, 20 plus uh, other different countries, they all have to work side by side, um, dealing with their differences, and um, sometimes quite quite stark differences. Um, as a result, our pupils grow up in this bilingual and multicultural environment. However, this is not an easy time to be operating a multinational uh, organization in China. Uh, for that matter, this is not the, an easy time to be a Chinese anywhere in the world. This is a sa sad chart that I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sharing here. This is done by the Pew Research Center, which is a US-based uh, information tank, they call themselves, I think. Uh, in the chart, there are uh, 12 different countries being listed. And in there, you can see uh, people in those countries, whether their opinion towards China are generally favorable or unfavorable, and it's tracking the opinion change for about 20 years. So the data started in 2022, and it's tracking to about uh, 2020. Um, and these countries that I list here are mostly advanced, sort of developed economies. So you can see there's increasingly negative evaluation of Chinese across all advanced economies. Uh, most countries would have start from uh, in the early 2000s, uh, most of them will have more people who are favorable towards China to start with. Compared to now, actually all of them have more people who are unfavorable towards China uh, than those who are favorable towards China. And what's even more worrying is in the past maybe two or three years, there has been a rapid and sharp decline of the percentage of uh, people from those countries who have a favorable opinion towards China. For me as a Chinese person, I do find it saddening, and I do wonder why. So I looked up why, and these, uh, these key words uh, that came up when Americans think of China, these are open questions, so it's not multiple choice, it's just unprompted open question, and these key words come up the most. So I'm guessing that most people think human rights in China is terrible. China's economy is growing fast, so people, everybody can see that, uh, but maybe that is, uh, that is becoming a threat economically towards, uh, towards the rest of the world. Therefore, it impacts China's relationship with, with your country. So in, in here, uh, for the US citizens, they talk about US-China relationship. And the reason why they're very suspicious about China is that we do have a very different political system. We're very different. And that's uncomfortable to uh, these mostly democratic, uh, advanced, uh, economies. And, um, and finally, most people think, after all, China infected the world with COVID-19. I wouldn't even attempt to try to counter all of these perceptions single-handedly in just one hour. And instead, I'd like to share maybe my personal experience. Um, I was born in Shanghai in the 70s, and I, um, I grew up there. When I, nowadays, when I tell people, uh, oh, I'm from Shanghai, most of them will actually think of um, the, the skyscrapers of the, uh, of the Lu Jiazui Financial Center, uh, or they will think about the European style, very in uh, impressive colonial style buildings, very well lit uh, at night along the, along the Bund. Uh, they will probably also remember those very fancy modern shopping centers that um, I show you some pictures of uh, earlier on. What they certainly wouldn't see, or what they certainly wouldn't come up with, is the image that I'm showing here, which is the Shanghai that I grew up in. This is the Shanghai in the 1970s. Most buildings are old and run down. Uh, most people are wearing very plain, dark colored clothes. There is no style, and it's, uh, the fabric I, I wasn't very comfortable. Um, nobody owned any cars. Um, private cars were unheard of. In fact, even bicycles were considered a luxury back then. Most people relied on buses to get about, uh, and the buses get so crowded uh, that I, I have a vivid memory of it. I, I was on those crowded buses, and there were some, uh, back then, there were some uh, foreign visitors who came to China and saw how crowded the bus were, and they did an experiment or uh, sort of some, some, some research. 
and jokingly said they, they saw that at peak hour, some of the buses in Shanghai uh, maybe held, uh, I can't remember the exact number, maybe held 20 people per square meter. And then they experimented whether they can put 20 pairs of shoes uh, in a square meter of floor space. In the end, they couldn't. So it meant that uh, at peak hour, uh, buses in Shanghai in those days actually took more, carried more people per square meter than you can lay down pairs of shoes flat, which means actually maybe some people were standing one leg and some people were tiptoeing. And I do remember that because I remember being very small when I was getting, trying to get on those very crowded buses. I was maybe five or six or maybe seven or eight years old. I was shorter than most people. So I was able to squeeze through the legs of uh, adults and get to the relative comfort near the window while my parents uh, are still far behind me being stuck near the bus door. Um, most accommodation were in rundown apartments. Um, my parents told me that initially they only had a square meters, which is a single room for all four of us. That's including my parents, my older brother, and me. And that single room doesn't have any facilities. You do have to use communal shared facilities, which means you share the kitchen and bathroom with your neighbors. Um, I don't have any memory of that eight square meter room. Uh, the, the earliest memory I had uh, was a 24 square meter two room apartment. Uh, so we did have two rooms. Um, although we didn't have a dedicated living room. The living room that we used during the day also acted as my parents and my uh, bedroom during, uh, during the night, while my grandmother and my brother shared uh, the other room on a bunk bed. Uh, and that two-room apartment also didn't have any facilities, which meant we still shared kitchen and bathroom with our neighbors. I was nearly 10 years old when we moved into our first self-contained independent apartment. I remember that was a two-bedroom apartment uh, totaling 60 square meters, which meant we actually had a dedicated um, living room, which we also use as a study. So in the evening, I was doing my homework on the dining table. Uh, but we had two uh, bedrooms. Uh, I still had to share a bedroom with my brother, which is also on that bunk bed. Uh, but my parents finally had their own private room. We had our own private facilities, our own bathroom and kitchen, so I remember we uh, all felt very, very happy when we moved into that apartment. In those days, the accommodation were assigned by your work unit. There wasn't a rental market, so you don't have a choice of where you live. You basically just get assigned your apartment. There wasn't a rental market, and uh, you, you certainly, nobody bought any properties, there, there wasn't private properties. So you don't have a choice of where you live or how, how big your apartment is. The, your work unit assigns it according to your needs. So if you're single, you're probably at the back of the queue. If you're a married couple with children, you're probably uh, are entitled slightly larger accommodation. Uh, everything was rationed in those days. It's probably the early 80s now, which was uh, in my memory. Ev everything was rationed. When you buy something, not only do you need to pay money, you also need these vouchers. So I, I show the picture of some vouchers in this picture. It's not money. It's actually sort of rationing vouchers. There was ra vouchers for everything, rice, oil, cooking oil, meat, um, clothes, fabric. Uh, so, and these day-to-day -day consumables the vouchers are assigned to you by the neighborhood committee on a regular basis. So it is sort of assigning, I guess this is distribution of goods according to needs, which is a communist principle. Um, and there are, there are certain things which are not day-to-day -day consumables. For example, if you want to buy a, buy a TV, or if you buy, want to buy a bicycle, which is a luxury in those days, or a radio, uh, you can't just buy it when you have money. You actually need to wait for a voucher. And these vouchers are distributed by your work unit. Uh, again, there is a queuing system. Uh, so every year, you, uh, a work unit might get a bunch of voucher, TV vouchers, you know, a factory of maybe 100 uh, people. They might get allocated 20 vouchers by the government. And they need to then work out their internal system, how they distribute these 20 vouchers most fairly. And certain things are only available for special occasions. There, there is this type of fish called crucian fish. Uh, any Chinese people know, know what I mean. It's called ji yu, huh? um, when I talk about it. It's, uh, it's particularly nutritious, therefore seen as being very good for new mothers. 
So uh, our family got allocated vouchers for two of these fish after, after my mother gave birth to me. And my dad had to go up very early in the morning to a fish market using these vouchers and, and money to buy two of this fish. And they had to queue in a pretty long queue. There's a queue of happiness and excitement. Everybody in the queue, they've just had a new baby. So they were talking to each other about, they were talking to each other about, oh, whether you had a boy or a girl, or how heavy was your baby when, when it was born. So there's, there's, I can imagine it's a happy occasion. Everybody got, got allocated two fish because they just had a, had a new baby. What was a little bit more difficult for my mum was that she was already 36 when she gave birth to me, so she didn't have enough milk to feed me. Um, so we needed, we needed to rely on bottled milk. I think formula milk in those days weren't even available. So you basically, babies basically drank the same bottled uh, uh, milk uh, as, as adults. But each family were only allocated one bottle of milk a day. Each family only had one bottle of maybe 300 milliliters of milk a day. That wasn't enough. So my mum actually had to rely on our neighbor's kindness. Two of our neighbors gave up their ration and gave their vouchers to us so that she can buy three bottles of milk, which was enough to feed me when I was a baby. And also there was the meat ration. I remember my brother sometimes complain about um, not having enough meat to eat. I think the ration came uh, to about maybe one kilo per person per month, which works out to be about 30 gram a day, 30 grams a day. That might be regarded as healthy diet nowadays. You know, you only need a little bit of meat with plenty of vegetable, uh, it might be regarded as healthy. But in those days, uh, my parents had to make sacrifices. They had to cut down on their meat intake in order to give myself and my brother enough to eat during our teenage days. So sacrificing for children really meant sacrificing for, uh, uh, in those days for parents. Therefore, sometimes I'm a little bit more understanding of the queuing etiquette or the lack of. Uh, queuing etiquette in China. Maybe it is still a residual from those days of scarcity, uh, which means that if you're a little bit behind in the queue, only by a few spaces, sometimes the thing that you come to buy, whatever it is, might just be sold out by the time you get to the front of the queue. Uh, education was free and compulsory for all. So this is a classroom that is typical of the classroom uh, uh, of the days that I grew up. Uh, so I did go to good schools in Shanghai, but all of my classes that uh, I remember were of size of more than 40 people. Some of them are actually more than, um, more than 45 people. It must have been tough for my parents to try to make ends meet, but I did remember having a happy and abundant childhood. I didn't remember being deprived. But then I was born in Shanghai, and my parents are both educated to university level, and they both held respectable jobs. Uh, that means the same probably can't be said for many other people living in China at the time. Um, I have a friend, um, a male friend, uh, who who is, uh, who does think that he, he was malnutritioned when he was growing up. Uh, he ended up being 20 centimeters shorter than his younger brother who managed to go to Beijing. He grew up in the countryside, rural countryside, and his younger brother uh, went to Beijing at the end, uh, age of 17 and ended up being 20 centimeters taller than him. So he was always a little bit upset about that. I have another girlfriend uh, whose parents died during um, their 40s or 50s. Um, by, by, uh, due to diseases that, by today's standards, are actually quite treatable. So that left, a, I think, a permanent scar on her. She was so motivated to, to, to work hard and get rich, and she is rich now. Uh, and the, the, but the biggest, the biggest regret in her life is, no matter how good her life is now, she can no longer share it with her parents who passed away in their 40s and 50s. Hence, we're talking about the biggest achievement in advancing human history, uh, in av advancing human rights in history. Uh, in the past 40 years, China has lifted 800 million people out of poverty. And this poverty, um, this is 78% of the world's total, by far the biggest. India, who comes second, uh, lifted uh, over 100 million people out of poverty, and that is not even close. 
So for people who are living in poverty, and this is poverty by the standards, uh, by the definition of the World, ba uh, World Bank, World Development Indicators, for, for those people, this is nothing romantic. This is nothing idealistic. It's actually a matter of life and death. Um, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these are the most basic bottom layers of needs. These are the physiological and safety layers of needs. Before these layers of needs are met, you can't even talk about higher levels of needs. Therefore, these are the most fundamental human rights. Um, let's get back to education. We talked about um, education in China and how it's compulsory and free for all. And this is a chart that compares uh, the illiteracy rate in 1949 um, and uh, up to about uh, 2011. Uh, as you can see, when the Communist Party took over and when the PRC was founded, 80% of the population uh, was illiterate. And today, that's less than 5%. And that's the whole population. Among youth, that illiteracy rate is next to zero. Um, again, a comparison to India, um, a notable difference is that not only is our literacy rate much higher uh, than India, what's even more important is that you cannot see a significant difference in China between men and women in terms of their access to education, while in India there is still a pretty significant gap. Um, tertiary education in China uh, grew from about 3.4% uh, in 1990. Uh, and that's why my parents, both being university graduates, are significant. They went to university in the early, uh, early 1970s. In those days, it must be less than 1% of the population going to university. Hence, I, I probably was already enjoying a pretty privileged upbringing. By, those stand, uh, by, by the standards of those days. Uh, so the tertiary education rate uh, in 1990 in China was just 3.4%, and that has grown to be over 50% in China now. Uh, that's not far behind UK. In the UK, it was about 20% in 1990, and, and now it's just, uh, uh, last I, I saw the figures, uh, 56% in uh, 20, uh, 2014. And if we look at the GDP, uh, we, we're, we're not even talking about GDP as a total. Uh, we're talking about GDP per, per capita here. Again, I don't want to pick on India, but I think this is an interesting comparison, given that we're both large population with ancient history going through fast development. In the 1990s, uh, GDP per capita in China and India are roughly the same. But since then, China's GDP has taken off. Now, nowadays, it's nearly five times the amount of India GDP. I went to the UK in uh, 1996. I still remember when I landed in Heathrow, I was amazed and impressed by how clean, how modern, how advanced it was. Um, I still remember a small, uh, a small incident, uh, actually, when I was at Oxford. There was a friend of mine, she had this light, which had a touch-sensitive switch. You just touch the light, then the light comes on, and you touch it again, and it goes off. Even back then, even that's something I've never seen, I've never ever seen in China. So I was amazed. I was just thought, oh, how, how does this work? I was sort of being doing scientific experiment. My friend, who was who was kind, uh, this girlfriend from, from Oxford, she was kind. She didn't, she didn't show any shock or surprise. But I know she must have tried to hide her feeling of, oh, where does this person come from, you know, coming from communist China who hasn't even seen a light with touch-sensitive uh, uh, switch. For her, it was an education on how you judge people. You don't judge them on what they know. You judge them on uh, their inte integrity and intelligence just because they come from a background where they might not have had uh, the same access to, uh, to information or same experience of the things that you have doesn't mean they are a less individual. I think my friend role modeled that back then. But to me, it is still something that I feel maybe a little bit ashamed of. Uh, uh, you know, why doesn't my country have the same thing that these people have? But balance started shifting uh, since the 1990s as our economy fast, uh, fast grow. Nowadays, whoever come from wherever they are uh, in the world, I, I, I would never be worried about um, 
materially or, or economically that we are behind. Because in China, especially in larger cities like, uh, like Shanghai, uh, we, we have the same. Uh, whatever they have, <laughs> we have, we have the same or even better in China. So on that, on that sense, we have already uh, caught up. But that is achieved by the, the immense hard work of the Chinese people. The chart on the right here shows the labor force participation uh, uh, in the world, comparing different countries in the world. Again, you see on this list, China is actually ranked top. 80% of Chinese men and 70% of Chinese women uh, work. Uh, and what's noticeable is that there's not a lot of gender difference, again, that is reflecting on the same access to, to education. While with, for example, India, again, who I think is the, to uh, is the bottom on that, there is immense difference between men's labor force participation and that of women. And also, Chinese women even work harder than men in France, Belgium, or Italy. There is a higher percentage of Chinese women who work than men in those countries. So, Yes, we have ach uh, achieved amazing growth, uh, but that comes uh, as a result of the, um, the extreme hard work of the Chinese people of the past 30, 40 years. As I said, when I was growing up, I was always growing up with a bit of a mentality of looking up to the advanced economies uh, in the West. I was motivated to work very hard because we were in a catch-up mentality. I still remember when I was young, schools uh, were open six days a week. So we had five and a half days of schooling. We had half a day of schooling on Saturday. And for my parents, I think they worked the whole day on Saturday. So we only had one day off every week. Um, but, uh, but now, China is, has caught up, and young people in China nowadays feel more equal. In fact, in some areas, I think China might, might even be leading in the world. Uh, one obvious area is 5G technology. Um, China is leading uh, the world in the deployment of uh, 5G um, uh, technology. We actually have 70% of the world's total base stations and 77% of handset. A distant second place is in the US. 7% uh, uh, of world's 5G handsets are actually in the US. And the third position is uh, uh, South Korea, who has 4%. In fact, in China nowadays, 9 out of 10 mobile phones being shipped are 5G enabled. And in other areas like quantum uh, technology and AI research, at least some aspects of it, uh, China is already leading. Therefore, it's no wonder that U the U.S. does feel threatened, uh, and uh, um, the new president, Joe Biden, openly talks about it's going to be a fierce competition um, uh, relationship moving forward. Any country which is trying to improve the living standards of 1.4 billion people, um, it is going to put a significant strain on the environment. Um, however, with China's government's power to set policy and with its uh, immense resources to build infrastructure, China is act actually accelerate, has act uh, accelerated the adoption of renewable energy. Um, the top right chart shows the percentage of electric vehicles deployed worldwide. Uh, the bottom color, the red color, uh, uh, is the percentage in, in China. So 50% of electric vehicles worldwide are in China. China also has a third of um, the world's wind power installation and also a third of the world's solar power installation. And that's installation. In terms of manufacturing or production uh, percentage, I think it's even higher. I don't have the exact percentage. I think it's something high, like 70% uh, of solar en uh, energy panel are produced in China. In September 2020, President Xi Jinping made an environmental pledge uh, while speaking at the UN General Assembly, that China will aim to hit peak emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. This is significant because while other countries have also made similar pledge, for example, UK, I think, has pledged that it will hit carbon neutrality by 2050, although it's not made into law yet, China and Germany are the only two countries among the current top 10 emitters to have made such a commitment. Uh, China's current global share in global emission is 
while Germany's is only 2%. Therefore, China's commitment to the world actually makes a far better, uh, far bigger difference compared to countries like Germany, UK, or even uh, uh, other smaller, for example, Nor the Nordics country, I think they're very environmentally friendly. They probably have a faster timeline, but their percentage of the mission is so small, the impact is, uh, is not as significant. The other top four emitters, um, US, India, Russia, and Japan, these are the other four emitters among the top five. Uh, none of them have yet give, uh, given a, t a clear timeline for carbon neutrality. So Chinese government is being responsible uh, uh, in, in probably the biggest challenge confronting human, human, human being, <laughs> uh, the climate change. So the continued investment in education and uh, the environment shows uh, Chinese government's commitment to sustainable and high quality growth. Um, this is a forecast of GDP by uh, Standard Charter Bank, so it's not even done by the Chinese government. Uh, it is trying to forecast the size of GDP in 10 years' time by 2030, and this is GDP as measured by purchase power parity. Um, as we can see, China is by far already the biggest econo uh, economy here, uh, twice, that, uh, twice the size of that of the US. Um, what is also noticeable is that when you look at the top 10 GDP uh, ranking countries, only very few of them would be uh, considered the current developed economy. So maybe only US, Japan, and Germany, which are ranked in the top 10 currently, uh, uh, or d regarded as the developed economy currently will still be within the top 10 in 10 years' time, which means that there is a definite and worldwide shift in economic and geopolitical power. Given that people's satisfaction quite often is the difference between their expectation and reality, uh, in a fast developing economy quite often people are happy because um, for my generation, our quality of life is genuinely better than our parents. And for my, for my parents, their quality of life is genuinely better than their, their parents. So, so we can see generation after generation, we, e we indeed are improving on our uh, standard of living. And even compared to 10 years ago, the difference is noticeable. It's, it's a notable difference. Without it sounding like bragging, I, I can honestly uh, uh, say that uh, for, those, um, for those classmates or friends uh, that I'm still in touch with uh, from, from my high school, all of them live in sizable, comfortable, modern apartments. Uh, they all own two family cars. They dine out regularly in nice, uh, in nice restaurants. Uh, they also spend lavishly uh, on, on luxury brands, like the ones we've seen. Uh, they would usually holiday overseas once or twice a year, and uh, whatever their children manage to get into, they, uh, whatever university their children manage to get into, um, they will be able to afford, fee, uh, afford the fee for those universities. I forgot to mention that when I went to Oxford, uh, my parents, who both held respectable jobs uh, in China at the time, because the average salary in China in those days were nowhere near the level that can afford an Oxford fee. Uh, I actually had a, had a whole year uh, with an Oxford University offer, but my parents not being able to afford the fee. Um, nowadays, uh, nowadays, any of my friends can. And this is unthinkable 30 years ago. And of course, I came from a very good school in Shanghai, but that very good school was not a posh private school. Private schools weren't even available when I was growing up. Um, instead, it was a very good government-run state school. And it's a selective school, so it has selection at age 12 and at, uh, another round of selection at age 15. Therefore, of course, those people who uh, were from my school, they're high achievers. So it's, it's no wonder that they have a good standard of living. Uh, and that's in the context of the whole population standards of living going up. So it's no surprise that um, in these worldwide surveys, in terms of people's satisfaction of their life and their satisfaction of their government, China repeatedly came top. Uh, um, it's because genuinely, um, especially among the youth, we are happy, we are satisfied with our life, and the support for Chinese government is high. 
Which brings us uh, to the question, why doesn't the rest of the world like us? You know, what's, uh, <laughs> why don't you like us? Uh, and I think that's probably to do with maybe political system, that we are, we are a very different, uh, uh, we, we do have a very different political system and that makes most people from Western democracies nervous. In discussing political system, I'd like to differentiate two distinct questions. Uh, the first one is how big is the government? Uh, which includes how centralized it is and how much resources it is, uh, is in control of, uh, which means how, how high percentage of a tax people usually pay. And that is a different question compared to uh, the, other, the other question, is this government democratically elected? Um, so let's first of all talk about big government, big government uh, and uh, what advantages that might have. The whole world is still living under the shadow of COVID-19. Um, so let's take a look uh, at exactly what happened just over a year ago in, in China. Reports of an unknown pneumonia disease started in Wuhan seafood market in December 2019. By January the 15th, there was the first confirmed case in medical workers. This is a clear indication of human to human transmission. Eight days later, by, 2000, uh, uh, by January the 23rd, that's just two days before Chinese New Year, which is the most significant holiday, annual holiday in China. The central government ordered the lockdown of the city of Wuhan. This is a city of more than 14 million people. Nobody was allowed to leave the city. Most people stayed at home. All schools and non-essential businesses uh, were shut down. I still remember back then when that first uh, happened, most foreign media took the position, took the line of, oh, this is a violation of human rights. Uh, most of them see the measures as being overly draconian. What followed was even more impressive and touching. The central government mobilized the whole nation in the fight against uh, the pandemic. A 1,000 bed hospital was built in a mere 10 days. Uh, let's take a glimpse of what that actually entailed. First of all, you need an emergency order, order led by Chinese construction company, uh, China construction company and Wuhan municipal government to command 7,500 builders and over 1,000 building machinery to make a commitment to the country and especially the suffering Wuhan citizens. In 10 days, a life-saving hospital with 1,000 beds will be built. Then you need Beijing Zhongyuan International Engineering Design and Research Institute to locate within 78 minutes. The complete design and construction drawings of the Xiaotanshang Hospital 17 years ago. Then it was submitted to Wuhan City Architectural Design Institute in its entirety. You need the City Architectural Design Institute to gather 60 designers within one hour, and at the same time contact hundreds of BIM designers across the country to participate remotely, to complete the construction drawings within 60 hours. You need Wuhan Hangfa Group to quickly enter the site to start site leveling, road drainage engineering construction, and at the same time, two listed companies, Gaoneng Huanjing and Dongfang Yuhong, formed an emergency team responsible for anti-seepage engineering, sewage treatment, and medical waste transfer facilities construction. You need the state grid, more than 260 electric power workers to work continuously for 20 hours 24 hours without sleep to complete the relocation of the two 10 kilovolts lines and the placement of 24 box transformers, the laying of 8,000 meters of power cables and the start of power transmission on time before January the 31st. You need E-Way lithium energy to provide a generator car for emergency power supply for key equipment such as communication base stations. You need Huawei, China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, China Tower, China Electronics, China Information Technology to cooperate closely and provide 5G signal coverage within 36 hours. They also delivered cloud resources, core system computing and storage equipment and built a remote consultation system linking remotely with the People's Liberation Army General Hospital in Beijing. In the meanwhile, 47,000 doctors and nurses were mobilized to go to Wuhan from all over the country to support them through the pandemic. These medical staff were risking their lives. They're leaving behind their families away for weeks and even months. 
to support their fellow countrymen was hit by the pandemic. The whole country pulled together to fight and support Wuhan. Only a centralized and authoritarian government would have the kind of power to mobilize resources in this fashion. 76 days later, the lockdown was eased. Uh, in fact, last week, or a few weeks ago, we just celebrated the one year anniversary of that. The result of that is millions of lives being saved. This is the uh, public data posted on the WHO uh, website in terms of number of COVID-19 related deaths per 100,000 population in each of the country. So you can see in the US, uh, 166 people out of 100,000 people died. Uh, so that's 1.6%. In the UK, it's even higher, 1.8. Um, then usually in the Western media, Japan and Australia would be regarded as having done a relatively good job, Espe especially Australia and New Zealand, I think. People see them as champions of having fought an effective war against uh, COVID. Little do I see any mention of China's success. China's death rate, number of deaths per 100K population is a mere 0 0.33, uh, which means it's only less, it's only less than 5,000 people. And I know that to be true because lots of people are questioning that. Oh, is this, you know, is the statistics re reliable? We are a community of over 1,000 staff, 4,000 pupils, um, and apart from a few people who returned back to China from overseas later in March, nobody in our community, which includes our staff and their family, our students, their parents, and their extended family, nobody contracted the disease locally. So I do believe the number. And uh, if China were to have the same number of deaths as US in terms of 100K uh, 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 people, uh, then China would have had an additional 2.3 million people uh, who have died uh, from the disease. And that's, of course, highly possible because the medical uh, infrastructure, medical resources uh, of China for many, for large parts of China is nowhere near as advanced as that of the US. So a powerful government is very useful in crisis. Uh, but people will ask, oh, what, when was the last time you had a major crisis like that? Uh, people will say, oh, the Sp Spanish flu over 100 years ago. So many people will say, oh, we're not willing to sacrifice our personal freedom uh, for something that only happens once uh, 100 years. But what if it's not once 100 years? Um, geographically, China, uh, China's west region actually houses the world's uh, uh, highest mountains, the Himalayas. Himalayas. The two great rivers in China are both prone for flooding. So since record beginning maybe 2,000 years ago, uh, if you look at historical record, flooding actually occurs in China regionally every other year, so basically all the time. And uh, on average, every 20 years, there are catastrophic level of flooding. Um, the last disastrous flooding happened in 1998. Uh, back then, six million, six million houses collapsed, collapsed. 220 million people were impacted. The direct economic loss uh, was 160 billion RMB, so that was really huge. And you can see pictures from these flooding. Um, the, the People's uh, Liberation Army on the top left, they're always on the front line of any natural disaster. Uh, this sort of tragedy means every generation will have in their living memory how powerless a mere individual is in the face of natural disasters. Back in, 2000, uh, in 1998, only uh, just over 4,000 people died of the flooding, and that's a tiny percentage compared to the over 200 million people uh, in fact, uh, uh, affected. And then at the bottom, you can see the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, the Three Gorges Dam is the world's largest uh, hydroelectric electric uh, project. It was completed in 2003. I actually went there four years ago on the cruise, uh, on the Yangtze Cruise River, a uh, 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 river cruise trip. Um, it took a flight of four, it took a fly flight of five locks for my cruise ship to be able to come down uh, the 185 meters drop uh, on the dam. So the project, the primary objective was flood control. Electricity generation was only secondary. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, the Yangtze River, after all these years, is finally safe. 
And flooding is not the only natural disaster that we face as a country regularly. The other one is earthquake. Earthquake is not even something you can forecast and, uh, uh, or you can't even build a dam to prevent that. Uh, people know, you, you probably know, anything over the scale of uh, 7.5 on the Richter scale is, um, is tragic. Um, and the last, uh, for, the, for the last 100 years, there were nine such huge uh, disastrous earthquakes. And the last one in our memory, which is, is fresh in our memory, it's just before the Beijing Olympics. Uh, it, it happened, uh, it's the Wen Chuan's uh, earthquake, happened on the 12th of May in 2008. In that earthquake, 100,000 people died, 400,000 people were injured, 2 million houses collapsed, and 47 million people were affected. Our Ai at home, Yang Ai, she's from Sichuan. I remember crying when I heard from her that her house in her hometown actually collapsed during this uh, earthquake. Um, luckily, nobody uh, from her family was hurt, but nevertheless, she had to rebuild her home. The government paid for about half of the rebuild cost. She had to use her savings, and we also chipped in a little. So last summer when my uh, son and I, uh, when my sons and I went to visit them in Sichuan, uh, my sons were so impressed with the three-story villa that they had in their hometown with the mountain river view. That's just an unaffordable luxury in Shanghai. So it was a major upgrade from the collapsed house uh, that she, she had. Therefore, uh, I, I once read in Tim Marshall's book, the book is called Prisoners of Geography. Western Europe has no real deserts. The frozen wastes are confined to a few areas in the far north and earthquakes, volcanoes, and massive flooding are rare. Europe's geographical blessings may not seem too apparent to the Europeans, but relative to many places, a blessing they are. And that probably lies in the key differences that we have. We are all prisoners of geography. While individualism, freedom, and independence are valued in Europe, in China, we have good reasons to value collectivism, interdependence, and unity. That explains why we are okay with a very big government, because it carries enormous responsibilities. Okay, then that brings us to the next question, is democracy <laughs> the only way? And on that, I, uh, I suppose I, I'd like to remind everybody that democracy is a relatively new thing. Uh, universal suffrage in the UK only took place in 1928, while in, the, in America it's, uh, it only happened in 1965. So actually, as a political system, it's only less than 100 years old. It's not something that is, as most people think, is, is tested, it's tried and tested, and it's the, it's the only way, it's the end state of all political systems. Um, and, and even though it's only a, less than 100 years old, we can already see signs of aging, corruption, and failure in democracy. Some people say that a country needs to get rich enough for its people to be well-educated enough for democracy to function well. Uh, some people say that um, Democracy doesn't allow for long-term planning, uh, so infrastructure investment like the bullet train we have in China, the environmental uh, renewable energy infra, uh, investment, those kind of uh, um, policies probably wouldn't carry through in a democracy, a democratically elected government where the policy will just swing uh, all the time. So even if it might be right for China one day, uh, it might not be right for China right now. Um, and um, as a country, despite the affluence that I talked about uh, that we can see in coastal cities, uh, we still have 50% of the population living on less than uh, 150 US dollars a month. So we're not a rich enough country yet. Uh, uh, and, and both US and the UK only achieved that un their universal suffrage a hundred years after their industrial revolution. Uh, and I don't think in China that revolution has completed yet. Here's another uh, supporting point of uh, the relationship between political system and quality of life. Uh, and I chose two indicators, life expectancy and uh, child mortality. And these are generally agreed by all. Everybody wants to live longer and nobody wants to see their children die. 
And as you can see, there's no correlation. Uh, China is towards the left, which means it's less democratic, but in terms of uh, life expectancy and child mortality rates is uh, scoring among the very best uh, uh, on, on, on this chart. Therefore, whenever people say, oh, democracy is the only way or the end state, my answer to that is not enough evidence, my dear, not enough evidence. That brings me to, very quickly, uh, to the final points uh, still on this uh, list of keywords. I've addressed all the other keywords by now. Uh, the final one is, is, is threat. Uh, people are threatened by a rising China. And I want to give you a historical view and hopefully put your uh, minds uh, to ease a little bit that we're not necessarily a threat just because we are now stronger. If you take a 2,000-year view, uh, to most Chinese people, we're not the new kid on the block. Actually, for most part of the past 2,000 years, we were the leading economy in the world. That only started to change in the mid-19th century, and that was the century when the European powers started to colonize most of the world. Um, so to China, we are simply reclaiming our historical position in the world. And even though China has always been rich and powerful, uh, Throughout history, the Han Chinese, uh, the, uh, the, the main ethnic uh, uh, group in China is the Han. The Han Chinese has never invaded another country. In fact, I give you a comparison of 15th century expedition. Uh, I'm comparing the seven expeditions by Admiral Zheng He. That was a, um, uh, a eunuch, actually, in the Ming Dynasty. He conducted seven expeditions uh, uh, from 1405 uh, to the Indian Ocean. And the, the giant ship in this picture is actually his ship. Uh, almost 100 years later, Christopher Columbus traveled in this tiny ship in comparison and discovered America. So I quote uh, the British philosopher Bertrand Russell from his book of The Problem of China, written 100 years ago, actually, in 1922. For many ages, the government of China has been in the hands of literally skeptics whose administration has been lacking in those qualities of energy and destructiveness which Western nations demand of their rulers. In fact, they have conformed very closely to the maxims of Zhuangzi. This is a Taoist philosopher. The result has been that the population has been happy except where civil war brought misery that subject nations have been allowed autonomy and that foreign nations have had no need to fear China in spite of its immense population and resources. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation, uh, my drive, my drive and my mission. Um, I quote Bertrand Russell again, he said, all the world will be vitally affected by the development of Chinese affairs, which may prove a decisive factor for good or evil during the next two centuries. For me, there is no higher calling than to contribute towards the deeper understanding and appreciation between China and the rest of the world. And that's exactly what we at Wellington China strive to do. All our children who grow up bilingually in a multicultural environment will act as bridges uh, to, between China and the rest of the world. I want to finish with a poem from China uh, from 2,000 years ago, actually. I will, I will say it first in Chinese. All Chinese people know this. Uh, I'll give you a transliteration. Every beauty has its uniqueness. Precious is to appreciate other beauty with openness. If all present itself with integrity and diversity, the world will be blessed with harmony and unity. Thank you very much.